Well, Tom, Tom's work was, um, was on various occasions it was mentioned to me over a period of, of around about five or six years. And various individuals that have been attracted to my work said, you really want to read into what Tom Campbell's writing about my big toe. Uh, but the person that really facilitated the link was uh, a young Slovak PhD student by the name of Martin Peniak. Um, who came along to one of my, he emailed me initially and then came along to one of my lectures that I did down in the south of England. And he approached me and he said, genuinely, you really need to speak to uh, Tom Campbell about his work. And there was an also uh, somebody else from my forum called Carl Lamarx. And Carl again had said that my big toe is really quite up your street. Uh, and then I think, Tom, I think we then, I think I might have then contacted you, I guess. And we, we swapped books, and yes. uh, it was, wasn't it? And mm -hmm. I then received the, the the trilogy of my big toe, and I think I sent you my two books. And, yes, you did. And I found my big toe to be one of these kind of books that you read, and as soon as you finish it, you want to reread it again because the depth in which Tom goes to and the, the power of his model is simply amazing. And I was going through it, making notes here, there, and everywhere because. All I could see was synergy everywhere. Now, Tom was coming at it from um, a slightly different angle to myself, but we were still coming to the same conclusions. And I like to use the analogy, it's rather similar to when David Bohm was doing his work on the holographic nature of reality and the holographic nature of the universe. And he was approached by, um, initially I think it was Carl Pribram's son, uh, and Carl Pribram is a psychologist that was based, probably still is, at Georgetown University. And what Carl was doing is he was doing it from the brain side outwards. So effectively, you know, there was the cosmological quantum physics model that um, David Bohm was working on. And then it was Pribram coming up from a different direction. And by the meeting of the two of them, they actually realized that, that their overall hypothesis of theory had so much greater strength by taking it from the two angles. And I know from reading Tom's work that I very much have that feeling in terms of what Tom does. Now, the other strange irony of this is that um, we both use the concept of my big toe, my uh, big toe, as an acronym. Um, hmm. And this this quite amazes me as to how we could have possibly come up with the two things because um, big toe for me is is what I call uh, my Bohmian IMAX grand theory of everything which we might get the opportunity to talk about later. And, of course, Tom's my big toe is my big grand theory of everything. So we both have toes, and Tom and I were, were talking on, um, on Skype about 20 minutes ago, and I was thinking we should be able to think of some kind of acronym around the word foot, or leg or something. <laughs> you know? Meta my big metatarsal, you know, something like that. Uh, that's really good. And... Uh uh, we, if we, you know, examine or a little bit of the work that uh, the both of you have been doing uh, individually, so to speak, in that sense, um, and we can get into obviously if there's, you know, if you, Anthony, feel that there's anything missing from the theory of everything that uh, uh, that Tom uh, you know, lays forward in that sense. But uh, Tom, Tom, maybe you can just comment quickly a little bit on on Anthony's work as well. How how did you approach this? Do you, were you fascinated? Do you think now ah, there's a little bit maybe something missing here and there, or or how did you approach uh, Anthony's work, Tom? Well, the uh, both of us are heading in the same direction. Obviously, uh, both of us are uh, uh, on, you know approached from different from different angles, but one of my favorite uh, things to tell people is that there is but one truth, but there are many, many, many valid ways of approaching that truth. And that's really a very good thing because some people will relate to this approach and some people will relate to a different approach. So the more approaches we have that uh, tend to converge, then actually uh, you know, the much better uh, we all are at trying to communicate what's going on. And people who read my book then will be able to appreciate Anthony's book more and will be drawn to that and vice versa. So hmm. I see it all as being very synergistic. We all are, we're not competing for who's got the right answer. We're all sharing our own ways of approaching that answer. And by the sharing, I think it's all, it's a much stronger story that we have to tell because of the multiple approaches. So when I looked at Anthony's, uh, the way we differ, you, you brought that up. Anthony has a little more of a physical 
uh, approach to to it, and uh, I have a less of one. I I'm in the virtual reality uh, uh, camp, and uh, Anthony's moving that way as well. But uh, he still has more of a of a, a physical basis to the things that he's doing, such as uh, you know brains and and pineal glands and things like that. Hmm. And though I realize the connection there, I don't put those at the at the center of the, I don't put that as the causal feature. In other words, the thing that's making it happen. I put that as a as a an artifact of what's happening. So that's a that's kind of a a little difference, but that's almost a technical difference. Um, hmm. Which is which is good. We should have these differences. Absolutely, that uh, helps to refine the work and so forth. And obviously, if we have any new listeners with us uh, tuning in right now, we recommend you obviously to go into the archive and listen individually to the programs, both that we've done with Tom uh, and Anthony. Uh, if you want to hear kind of a full, uh, more in-depth, uh, you know, uh, outlay or, or presentation of, of uh, their individual material and how they dovetail as well, uh, very very interesting. But. I want to get into the topic a little bit of what drives reality, how reality is created and so forth as well. Uh, I think when we both had you guys on individually, we talked quite a bit about the mes- metaphysical aspect as well to all of this and some of the, the weirdness mm-hmm. that we see out there and to try to, to be able to explain some of those things from this per- per- perspective. But maybe we can begin with you, Anthony, and maybe you can just uh, give us a short little outline, if you will, of you what you think drives reality, how it is created uh, what some of the rules maybe is in that sense, and then we can hear from Tom, and we can we can compare a little bit or, or continue from that point. Uh, but Anthony, go ahead. Okay, okay. From my point of view, initially, when I first started with my first book, is the life after death, the extraordinary science of what happens when we die. I was coming from a very neurological point of view because I was one. I was looking for an explanation. For, for certain neurological phenomena such as uh, deja vu sensations, near-death experience, these type of things. And I was very much working on the idea that these in some way were, were, were neurologically based, which, which I still consider they are. And I think Tom and I would both agree that we're using the term neurologically based in a very, very loose way. If we consider the, uh, the brain or the, the, the physical, that the brain is some kind of a portal, as it were, um, between alternate realities or, or gives us an opportunity to understand the reality behind the reality. But my viewpoint was trying to, to come to a, a model of what might happen to human consciousness at the point of death. And what I did was I came to the conclusion, to cut a long story short, and as you said, the two interviews that I've done with Red Ice do actually explain this in, in extensive detail, you know, four hours worth of it. Mm. But in, in general terms, what I'm saying is that at the point of death, we we fall in time slows down for us and as tom says in his work you know time time is is just a, is 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 a construct of consciousness time is something that you know as tom would say was probably brought in by his um i don't know his absolute unbounded oneness probably or something like this but effectively the idea that time is is relative to consciousness and relative to perception and what I suggest is that at the point of death or close to death, we, we, we fall out of time. And what we do is we slip into something I call the Bohmian IMAX. And what I mean by the Bohmian IMAX is that it is um, a, a, a recreation, uh, a memory recreation of your whole life from the moment of the bir- your birth to the moment of your death, rather similar to the Matrix movies and rather similar to a lot of themes we have in modern movies, the idea of what is reality, are we living within a waking dream? Uh, And I suggest that we are, or indeed the 75% of us who have deja vu sensations. And these individuals, when you have a deja vu, you have a memory that you've lived this time before, and this is because you're existing within this wrongly termed brain generated I think it's the wrong way to term it it's not necessarily brain generated but what it's doing is it's accessing information from from somewhere now this again will be analog- uh, analogous to what Tom comes to the point of view where the where our life memories are contained somewhere and the brain accesses them now my latest model because uh, funnily enough um, I've just submitted my third book to my publishers and I have a section on Tom's work on that and this book will show how I'm moving towards Tom's point of view, is that that I suggest that this information is probably being drawn up from what the mystics would call the Akashic Record. Uh, I would prefer to call it um, the zero-point field and using zero-point energy 
particularly applying the the the, the theories and the hypotheses of uh, a Hungarian researcher called uh, Professor Irvin Laszlo, and the idea that that some were encoded within information, and as as Aslo, uh, Laszlo calls it, information, that information is the base of everything else. You know, as Tom would say, we live within a, a digital reality. Hmm. That could be a which is a huge computer simulation, and I come to the same conclusion. But in the what I say is in the final moments of life, we fall into this computer simulation, and we start to relive our own lives in a form of reincarnation, which in fact is literal reincarnation. But what is really happening is we are living our own life again in a kind of a groundhog life state, and as we live this life again, when this second life comes to an end we go back and we live it again and again but because the information is being drawn from the Akashic record and because if you bring in the model of Everett's many worlds interpretation uh, and the idea of many minds as well is the idea that the computer simulation we are living in in fact has programmed into it as, as a ten Tom would probably agree has programmed into it all the potential futures of every decision you can possibly make and as Tom rightly says, you know, there are three databases running here. There's the present database, which is what I'm perceiving at this moment. Then there are the potentials of the future that are already encoded in because a version of me within the Everett's Many Worlds interpretation, just to step back there, you know, Everett's Many Worlds interpretation suggests that there are literally trillions of universes and within those trillions of universes are trillions of, of us having this conversation. And each one of those trillions of us will encode a memory pattern onto the Akashic record. So what effectively it means is that all the versions of me have lived my life many, many times. And that has been recorded into this super duper first person virtual reality computer game. Hmm. When I'm living the computer game within the Bohmian IMAX, every decision I make will put me along a different path within the computer game. But of course, as we know with computer games, if you go down a certain route and you end up dying or making a wrong decision, all that happens is you're taken back to the start of the game, or the game master, the being I call the daemon, hmm. which we'll come on to later, is the person that's actually playing the game, as it were, whereas we are the idol on the lower self, is the sprite on the screen. So therefore, we, we live with this in this computer simulation, coming draw, being drawn up from the Akashic Record. In my new book as well, I actually do the model of how this may work. Uh, and what it does is it's almost, I, this is why I like the, the, Bohm, the, uh, the David Bohm idea of enfoldment. And the idea is, you know, we're creating our universe, as Tom again says, and Tom and I both agree, you know, this is the universe we are existing in, and both the, the consensual reality we live within as well, um, what Tom would call as um, physical matter reality. Is, is still a creation of consciousness in one way or another. Mm -hmm. And what we're doing is we're modeling it all the time and we are encoding it and we're living within it. Um, and I believe this is exactly what David Bohm said when he had something called enfoldment. And it's like the concept of a, a lay, um, uh, um, uh, uh, a holographic image, that a holo each part of a holographic image contains the whole. Mm -hmm. And it's the same with these records. It's, it's, it's things enfolded into themselves. You know, I always think of the wonderful line by William Blake, to see heaven in a wild flower. You know, and I suggest that the whole universe can be found in your teardrops. Mm. And within that universe will be you. So it enfolds within itself. And this, I would think, is, is what the um, absolute unbounded manifold that Tom talks about. Uh, well, I'd, I'd like to ask Tom here then at that point how... I think we touched upon a little bit of this as well the last time we had you with us, uh, Tom, but how physical uh, do and obviously if there's any points here that you want to argue about in terms of what Anthony has presented, please go ahead, but also the, the, the computer simulation, uh, Anthony alludes to that this is basically then, a, it, it's being run by uh, the daemon in that sense, it has an administrator, but how physical do you see this? Is this a a server in that sense standing somewhere even if that is on a dimension if you if you will that we cannot uh, see right now or, or have access to in that sense but uh, is, it, is it a computer or how do you view that uh, Tom? Okay well you ask a question how physical is it? You have to understand that physical is a point of view 
physical is not something that is an objective thing that stands alone. In other words, when you are in this reality, in this virtual, digital, information-based reality, this reality seems physical because this is the, you know, you're, you're getting data within the rule set of this reality frame. Now, when you're dreaming, you're not in this reality frame anymore. Now you're in a dream frame, and that seems physical. And when you're out of body and you're experiencing things, those things seem physical. In other words, physical is is defined by the perceiver, it's a, by the viewer, if you will. So where you are and where you, you know, what uh, databases, what uh, data stream you're connected to, you see is physical. It's there. You touch it, you smell it, you feel it, you have certain, you know, rule sets you have to abide by. And everything else seems non-physical. So there really is no such thing as physical or non-physical. They're just a point of view. Reality is reality. It's all information. And to say, well, this one is the physical one, well, that's just because our point of view is here. We're engaged in this particular data stream, so this seems physical. So there really is no such thing as physical. There's really no such thing as non-physical. It's all just a big informational field. And there are different data streams, different aspects of it. And uh, so there is no big physical computer someplace on another planet or in another mm-hmm. dimension that's that's doing this and right. those beings are you know playing this video game. It's all one thing, and that's consciousness. Consciousness is that digital information field. So in that sense, you know, you can't answer that question because physical really is just uh, a perspective of the of the viewer. That's that's right. And so that uh, that that's that answer. Um, as far as the things that, that, that uh, Tony was talking about, well, you know, we describe, we have to describe these things with our language. And basically, language is symbol and metaphor. And Tony and I use different metaphors. You know, he will, he will call, you know, a, a daemon, and, and in my terminology, you see that's something else. So, hmm. it's a, it's, there's always a problem in communication in that uh, we use different metaphors. And there's a few places, though, where there's some, some significant difference. But there, it's not a difference, if you will, so much on the, main, on the main line of where we're going. Because, yes, I agree, you know, this is the virtual reality. And, yes, there are these informational fields. There's these databases. And, yes, one of these databases is what I call the probable future reality, which lays out the probability of every possibility. The probability of everything that, uh, you know, that could happen. Hmm. And yes, we make choices. And as we make choices, we thread our way through that possibility. Um, you see, this is all sounding very much like uh, what Tony said. And then we live in the present. And then this, this, uh, all of this, this probability distribution of all the choices of all the players that are, that are interactive in this, in this game called our universe, um, they, as soon as the present moment's over, all those possible choices now become part of the historical database, which is all the things that we did, which is what I call our history thread, and all the things we could have done but didn't, that's what I call the non-actualized history. But actually, we're making three databases here, but they're all just one big database. And the probable future, as, as the time uh, clicks on, and time, yes, is a, uh, it's, it's a local um, process, that every reality frame has its own time. The dream reality frame doesn't run on, you know, the same clock that uh, this physical matter runs on. Mm-hmm. All reality frames have their own clock. They're all virtual realities. So, <clears throat> so we have this, this database then that uh, starts with all the, the probabilities of all the possibilities. And as the present moment is where we have free will, we make the choices, and then out the other side we have the... The, the database that's everything that did happen and everything that could have happened. Now, they, these databases then make up what um, the Hindus many, many years ago called the Akashic Records. And that's all the information. So one of the places that Tony and I would, dis, would, would maybe have a, a, a disagreement, uh, again, it's not, it's not fundamental. It's just in the metaphors we use. Hmm. Is He talks about a many worlds, many minds, and that all of these worlds are op- operating independently, and all of it exists. I don't necessarily do that in the, in the same sense that Tony described it. 
what I will say is that you have this 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 database, and okay, we have the the many possible worlds, if you will, but they're not all independent worlds progressing. All the actors are in there interacting. All they are is probabilities of what the possibilities are. What could happen next? What are all the choices we can make in the next delta t, which is like the the cycle time of the uh, of the simulation? Hmm. So we have that, and then we have this historical database. So it's not that there are um, well, you'd almost end up with an infinite number. You see, you end up with this number that's so big because every time an electron, you know, changes, you know, its spin, then you have to end up with a different uh, reality frame because now that's something different. Every every difference then creates another reality. That to me gets unwieldy. It's too much. It uh, is unnecessary. So all the action by the players, us, individuated units of consciousness, is going on in the present. Yet we have this projected of all the possibilities and the probabilities that we will make, various choices. And then in the history database, all those probabilities are still there. So you can go into this history database and you can do what-if analysis. You can say, well, okay, here we are and, uh, okay, it's 1943 or 44 and uh, what if, you know, uh, Adolf Hitler had won uh, World War II? You know, what would it be like now in 2010? Hmm. And you can go back and run through those. And it's not that you're jumping from, from one reality frame to the next as it is as you're going through this database according to the probabilities. So you have, this prob- you know, you have all these probabilities, and they're all relative to each other. You say, well, if this didn't happen, then what would be most probable that did happen or what could happen? And if this didn't happen that way, so you can do all those. And these databases are wonderful. You know, they're not like uh, the libraries – that we're used to, you know, they're very linear. Hmm. In this database, you have all the possibilities. So you can take all of the things that could have happened in any which way, and you can, you can play those, and it's like being there. It's like you're in the movie, okay, because that's the level of detail captured by the database. So your intent programs where it is you want to go. If you want to say, all right, if this changed, then show me all the most likely things that would have happened after that. So then you basically the program runs you through all the uh, largest probabilities that derive from that thing happening. Hmm. So you can, you can run through it. Hmm. And if you get in there and wander around and don't really know what you're doing or how it works, then you can easily get confused because there's all these reality frames and people uh, wander in them sometimes when they're doing out of body and sometimes when they're uh, you know, meditating and they'll get pieces of data and sometimes the data fits they can go look it up and it's perfect and sometimes it just doesn't make any sense well that's because they're they're not necessarily on our history thread anymore you know they're mm-hmm. in something else and if you don't if you're not able to control your intent and your focus very carefully then you can kind of wander around and it becomes it becomes confusing so that's yeah, so there are these little differences but you see Anthony and I end up basically at the same place anyway even though we have some different ideas of of the details of how we got there mm-hmm. and we have a lot of different different metaphors. So I, my model is a little simpler and doesn't require, you know, these, these huge numbers of, of um, parallel realities all chugging along with all the little people in them chugging along. The only people in my scheme that have free will are the people in the present. That's where all the decisions are. There are really no people in this, these future probability or in the historical. They're just data. Hmm. Uh, they're not actors, and that's one of the things that once you learn to get around in these records, that's, you know, I once thought the other way too, that I thought that they were, you know, that they were different realities that were still all interacting with free will, but that wasn't the case, and, and you can test that by realizing, by going into these um, historic databases, asking your questions, and pretty soon you, it, it seems kind of stilted. It's not quite as colorful as it was, and you realize that the reason is that you don't have a lot of um, randomness going on there. You really are walking through a database. It's kind of buttoned down, and you don't get all of the, the uh, reactions and interactions that you would expect. It's almost like a reality that seems as real as this one, except it's a little flat. It's just a little stilted, and mm-hmm. that's because you're working through a database with probabilities rather than a Real live bunch of people executing free will. Free will. Now that simplifies now the model a whole lot, and uh, you get all the same results without all the complications. So I guess that's why I go there. Being a physicist, 
I'm into uh, you know Occam's razor and and taking the the uh, simplest explanation that that gives you the that gives you the right answer. Right. So that that's a little bit uh, you know. Tony talked for a long while, and I can't remember all of the <laughs> details he said. As we were going on, I was thinking, oh, yeah, there's something I could come up with. By now, most of that is lost. But all in all, Tony and I are on the same sheet of music. We right. just differ some by the detail. That's right. Uh, let's see if we can uh, bring some of these points up again, of course. But I think it's fascinating with this idea of the, of the, of the access to these historical databases as well and how we, how, we, how we get into those what-if kind of scenarios and how, how we plot that in, in one sense. And obviously... Uh, some people will, will will figure, as you mentioned, uh, Tom, that this people can access this through meditation. I personally think about, ah, uh-huh, obviously that's how remote viewing works. Works, for instance, sure, uh, out of body experiences, uh, other kinds of ways. So to kind of tap into this, the different lines of probability here in that sense. And uh, I mean, Anthony, you you obviously began looking at this from from the point of view of life after death, and also obviously highlighting the deja vu experiences, kind of, you know, if I put it this way, normal uh, weirdness that can happen to basically everybody uh, in in life, although they not might be into remote viewing or meditation in that sense. Um, but what's your take on that, Anthony? How would you say that we can access some of these different what-if scenarios? And and also, are you agreeing that with, with Tom that it's not all playing out at the same time, but it's it's just information out there and, it, and it's depending on our choice? Uh, that, oh, no, that I'd, drives I'd, the main uh, timeline, Anthony? Yeah, I'd very much agree with Tom in the sense that it's information-driven, you know, and that effectively when it comes down to it, it's binary notation, you know, it's it's as simple as that, it's digital. And I think that the more we research into the nature of reality, the more it seems to be digitally processed. For instance, you know, the idea that the time itself, I mean, people have been talking recently about the idea of something called a chronon, which is a particle of time. And again, I was intrigued when, when Tom did his interview with you when he was talking about the Planck time, you know, the 10, point, uh, 10 to minus 44 uh, seconds, you know, the idea this is the smallest possible bit of time. And of course, the Planck length being the smallest bo- part of, of reality. Hmm. And of course, the implication is that these things um, are quantized. So effectively, we perceive them being a continuum, but the reality is that they're not. They're quantized. They're sort of bits of information that are related to each other. Now, one of the things that, again, I, I you know, I was fascinated on Tom's comments there is, about, again, about, and it's a wonderful analogy there, and it's very true, and I deal with this in my books, and particularly my latest book, um, where I deal with lucid dreaming uh, and out-of-the-body experiences and distance viewing. And Tom's quite right. You know, when you are in an alternate state, the idea to consider this reality to be the reality, in other words, implies that there's a kind of base reality that is really solid and real. But of course, if you talk to psychologists and you talk to psychiatrists, effectively one of the biggest mysteries of of, of conscious experience is something called qualia. You know, the way we internally generate the reality around us in the way we do for instance, one of the things that's long surprised me is how the visual system works, whereby we can generate over a small postage stamped image that's inverted and placed on the back of the eye. The brain can create this three dimensional multicolored reality that encompasses everything in our visual field. And it's clearly because the brain or something inside is modeling that reality and presenting it to consciousness. And consciousness, in fact, as you're probably aware, you know, effectively uh, we process information and there's a delay, there's a buffering going on before conscious experience is presented to whatever the little homunculus is in the head. Hmm. Um, So therefore, there has to be some kind of recording process going on here. Uh, So I totally agree with Tom on that. Also, going back to your very first point about the my Adelon and Damon concept, I also have a concept, and I've been discussing this with a group of associates I've got called the Walker Group, and we we meet regularly in Liverpool, our local city here. And we've been debating this for some time and revisiting some of Tom's writings over the last few weeks. Um, You know, we've come up with a concept called the Uber Daemon, and the Uber Daemon sounds so similar to to, um, Tom's larger consciousness system. The idea that there is is a, a kind of a part, there is a, a consciousness that is, that is experiencing reality through us. 
and I use the analogy, it's rather like consciousness or this the, the larger consciousness system is using us almost like characters in this ongoing soap opera, hmm. whereby it's experiencing itself or experiencing life and everything else through what we do. And as Tom very much makes the very strong point, we have free will within this as well. So that each part of the, the program, as it were, manifests its free will throughout the program. So in many ways, Tom and I are coming from different directions, and I readily admit that I'm, st I'm still fairly rooted in the, the scientific method of, of you know, analyzing things. I wouldn't say that I'm a, a, a reductionist in the sense I do realize that there are certain things that science can never explain. It's something David Chalmers calls the hard problem. And the idea that we'll never really explain where consciousness comes from, because you can look at the neuronal systems of the brain, you can look at the neurotransmitters of the brain, but it still won't get you anywhere near a consciousness. So consciousness is something that's possibly out there. It's probably a field of some description. Um, who knows? Hmm. But effectively, the digital model, to me, is the most beguiling. You know, um, I, I adore the work of people like Nick Bostrom. And the idea that we're in it, that, that this is a simulation we are living within. And that, that is so beguiling. And as we move on, as we understand more about cybernetics, as we understand more about the nature of information, the more that becomes clearly the way to go forward. Right. You know, and again, as Tom would say, you know, 100, 110 years ago, science thought they knew everything. You know, the famous quotation that, you know, we, we know everything, we really need to, to fine tune things to, to the next fourth decimal point and we'll have a grand theory of everything and then you know we had black body radiation that didn't quite fit we had the photoelectric effect that didn't quite affect and then Einstein came along with his revolutionary new looking at information and remember he didn't do it through experimentation he did it by sitting back and thinking about what it would be like to travel on a light wave you know so clearly the paradigm the paradigm we live within seems to answer 95% of the questions, but the black swans are the things that interest people like Tom and I, and it's the black swans, the things that don't fit, are the clues to the next paradigm we're going to create. And again, as Tom has said, you know, if you are, if you are within a system, and we are within this consciousness system, we are within the program, we can't understand what's outside of the program because we can't, because we're not outside of the program. But what we can do is come up with some kind of a model of understanding of what consciousness really is. And of course, everybody listening out there, the one thing you know with absolute certitude is that you are a consciously aware being. You know, that's the only thing you actually know. And it's the only thing we know empirically to be the case. Because, of course, if you look at the word empirical, back to its Latin roots, it actually means experience. That's right. And experience. Hmm. So all we can absolutely know, I'm not saying I'm a Cartesian, but the argument is Descartes was quite right. The only thing you actually really know with any certitude is that you, you, you think, therefore you am, mm. or you th think, therefore you are. Yeah, right. but, but clearly, somebody else could be thinking for you. <laughs> so th this whole idea as well of, of uh, well, I mean, obviously some people, uh, uh, you know, from a theological point of view would, would put the name God instead of an, uh, an uber dame on uh, Anthony in that sense. and. And obviously, I think many people are describing the same thing there. But um, what's your uh, take on that, Tom, in terms of somebody or whatever it now is living in that sense through us, creating experiences? I mean, when you were with us last time, we talked about, I think, the level of coherency in terms of information exchange, if you will, in that sense. And you talked about love, obviously, being an, an, an essential, if not the most important mm -hmm. you know, level of coherent exchange in that sense to this as well. Uh, and I, obviously I can't help to, to, to wonder about some of the negative things that we have happening in our world as well. And if that is an, another experience, if you will, that this consciousness is, is having and therefore we are, we are a part of that and experiencing those uh, things. But what's your take on this, uh, Tom? Well, you have to, uh, you know, we have to uh, answer the question of given that there is this, you know, if we think of it as a being, that already creates a problem. But let's just, let's just start there and try to work our way out of the hole. If you think of this uh, uber daemon or the larger consciousness system as an individual and 
we are existing as thoughts in its mind and that kind of stuff, then you have to answer the question, why would it want to do that? You know, yeah. if you have this big being there and it has all of this capacity and ability and obviously brilliance beyond our comprehension, why is it playing this, this rather, uh, you know, I don't know what we call it, uh, a game, you know, game that yeah. we find as our reality. In mm-hmm. other words, what's the point? Yeah. You know, why, why would it do that? It would be doing things certainly more interesting and intelligent than that. So you have to see the whole thing as a system. And when you do, you realize there are, you know, it's not that this is the uber being. Now, the, it, you know, it's, it's the, the uber daemon, perhaps, because that's a more general idea than the, than the being. But I call it just the larger consciousness system. And the larger consciousness system is just a self-aware data field. And we get to the point of, well, where did that come from? And like Tony was saying, you're outside of the box there beyond what you can see. So we just can't answer that question. We can't know everything because if you are consciousness, you have to be something else to get outside of consciousness. And we're not something else. We can't get outside of the system that we are a part of or that, uh, you know, that uh, where we ex- exist within that system. So anyway, we don't know those answers to those questions of where did that come from? We just have to say, well, you know, don't know. Hmm. But we can model what it is we do know. And my, my take on that is that you have this, this system. It evolved. It didn't just happen because then it's a problem. Well, who made that big thing, you know? Who right. made the Uber being? That's right. So it just evolved. It was an aware potential that could differentiate states, and eventually it grew into the larger consciousness system, like everything else does by evolution. Now, evolution has to have a purpose. Things don't just evolve in every direction randomly. They evolve because of, of constraints that they have on it, and it has a purpose. It's an information field. All information fields um, can be looked at in terms of signal and noise, if you will. Information and non-information. Noise is just random bits and carries nothing. You know, it means nothing. Uh, information, being able to differentiate one state from another, say, requires a lowering of the entropy. Entropy is a measure of disorder. So this thing to evolve had to lower its entropy. And how does one lower its entropy? Well, it's just it starts out kind of like uh, any other uh, basic uh, evolution. It it uh, tries things and sees how it works. Random things happen, and if they help you re- decrease entropy, then you try to do more of those. And the ones that go the opposite direction, you don't. So it evolves. And in the process of this evolution, being one monolithic thing is very limiting. So what it does is it breaks itself up into a large number of things that can interact with each other rather than just one thing sitting in this armchair contemplating by itself. Now there's lots of things that are interacting. Suddenly the, you know, if you just look at this as, as information theory, suddenly the, what the scientists would call novelty of the system goes up dramatically because right. you have all these things interacting and they have to interact with free will. In other words, they have to make, whatever, you know, do any interactions that they do based on their own set of decisions for their own reasons. Otherwise, there's no value to it if it's, if it's scripted. So, in any case, the system is, is the whole thing. You know, we talk about we're all one. You know, it's all one big thing and we're a part of the one. Well, that's literally true, not just figuratively true. It's this one larger consciousness system and this, we kind of, bubble up out of the system, if you will. And as we are interesting, as productive, that we help the system evolve by having experience through our interaction, then we are lowering the entropy of the system as we lower our own entropy. As we grow up, evolve, become love, love is, a, is correlated with lowering entropy. Uh, love is defined as the expression of a low entropy consciousness that defines love. So I see it, uh, I kind of pull it all together in the sense that, yes, we are, you know, you can make this, this analogy, the techies will like it, the, the non-techies will, will think it's horrible, but, uh, you know, you know about refrigeration cycles where you have a fluid that just keeps going round and round and round in a, in a closed cycle and you have a compressor and it compresses the fluid and then it 
pushes that compressed fluid through a little hole and it expands. Well, on one side of the hole where the pressure is, it's hot. On the other side where it expands, it's cool. Hmm. And you can make that, a, that's how heat pumps work. And you can make that a, a heater or you can make it a refrigerator, depending on which side of that orifice you want to stick your, your heat exchanger on. Hmm. So that's, and then the fluid goes through the hole, you know, which expands it, it gets cool and goes back to the pump. And the pump pumps it, gives it pressure, and it just keeps going around and around and around. So that's a closed cycle um, system that heats or refrigerates. Now, we're sort of like that. We're part of a, a system, and we go round and round and round through these experience packets, or lifetimes, if you will, and each time we lower our entropy a little bit, or at least that's our goal, and as we do, you know, the whole system lowers its entropy. So in that view is we are, you know, we're like the refrigerant, you know, we are the working, you know, the working fluid, the working substance of the larger system of consciousness. We are it, and it is us. And it, we get, you know, we exist, basically, bubbled up out of this larger system to play these roles in these virtual realities. And our universe is not the only virtual reality. There are other virtual realities. Uh, I come from a little different uh, direction. Though I'm a physicist, I'm a scientist, but I come from a kind of a, a, a twofold direction. One, I, I learned early on with Bob Monroe about out-of-body and, and uh, talking with you know non-physical entities, exploring the larger reality, uh, visiting other reality frames. So I had all of that on one side. So when when uh, Tony talks about the you know that you survive death and and uh, what happens there, well I've you know hundreds of times I've been I've watched that I've been a part of it. You can go to where people are dying and you can watch the transition. You can help with the transition. Hmm. So all of that is just a part of my experience. So it's not something that needs to be. Uh, proven, I guess, to me. It's just uh, as much a part of my experience as sitting here talking with you on, on, uh, on the radio. Yeah. So, and I'm aware of all these other reality frames, and I've been to, to many of them. And, and uh, so I've got that side. On the other side, I'm a physicist, and I approach everything with logic and with um, rationality. It all has to make sense. So it's these two it's these two part of me that would seem to be kind of uh, diametrically opposed, but they're not. They all actually come to the same conclusions in the same, in the same way. So we see that science actually predicts or explains this, you know, the out of body, the life after death, all these things are, are uh, seen as, as rational. If you have this uh, bigger picture of the, of the way it works. So yes, I do see this larger consciousness system, but it's not a being it's not the being pulling the strings and we're the pet people, all right? right and it's right. playing us because it, we amuse it, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, we add humor, you know, to its existence. That's not what's going on. We're here and we have to interact. We have free will and we sink or swim by our own choices. And if we make good choices, we move toward love. The whole system, you know, moves forward with that because we're lowering the entry of the system because we're part of it. And as we make bad choices and move uh, toward fear, then we're moving the system the other way. You know, it doesn't work. But you have to have the free will, otherwise it doesn't work. You know, the, you can't, uh, the, you have to have free will in order to have consciousness. And you have to have consciousness in order to have free will. Those two are logically necessary for the existence of the other. Hmm. That's just the way that, that works. So I see it as all one big uh, coherent uh, picture. So the reason why, why would this uh, larger conscious system want to dream us up and, and run these, uh, these scenarios? Well, because we're, we're part of the working fluid that drives its own evolution. This working system is still evolving. It's not a done deal. You see, it's not just sitting there done and now it's playing with its pet people. It's evolving as well. Hmm. And we're part of that evolutionary process. And that again comes back, doesn't it, Tom, to the whole idea of David Bohm and holism and, and everything else, and the idea of the holographic nature of reality, possibly, well, reality using it in the term we prefer to use it as digital reality, and the sense that, you know, we are part of the greater whole. Now, in terms of, of philosophy and su such like, the, the term is panpsychism, and the idea that everything, life is a unity in one way or another, but what panpsych, you know, this is even greater than panpsychism, because what it's saying is that everything that is perceived, everything that is out there, is part of a something which is, which is a digital reality. 
and indeed one of the major problems of, of, um, of people who are just deists have the major problem, the concept of, of the nature of evil. Now, I think um, Tom's uh, model of the idea of moving to um, lower states of entropy is absolutely a perfect analogy, and his concept of love, I think, works very, very powerfully, because this does explain and gets over the problem of what's called theodicy, and the idea of what it, what, why, does, why does evil exist, why does evil happen? Well, evil is just part and parcel of the way things are. You know, in other words, um, whatever is the my uber daemon, for want of a better term, is not responsible in that way for everything that's around. It's part of it in exactly the same way as everything else is. It's almost trying to look at a worldview that is that is subtly different. We are all part of everything, and everything's part of us. And I think this well, holism concept is the way things tend to be going within science as well. Yes, if you didn't have uh, <laughs> if you didn't have uh, evil or the possibility of evil, then you couldn't have free will. Correct. You see, people have free will. They have to be able to make bad decisions as well as good decisions. Otherwise, it's not free will. If you say, "Well, here it is," and you all have free will, but you can you can decide anything you want as long as you decide what I want. You know, that's yeah. not free will. And, they, they uh, make us automatons, wouldn't it? It would make us literally like sprites in a, in a computer game that, that is dependent yes. on the movement. But in order to have the magic of life, you have to make mistakes, you have to make errors. And of course, that's one of the models I use in my first book. And one of the introductory passages, I turn around and I say, we learn by our mistakes. And that's one of the arguments I've used for why my model, I think, works logically is that if you are reincarnated as somebody else in, in the old reincarnation model, effectively your, your, your memories are wiped clean, you don't know who you are, you're reincarnated as somebody else and you start from baseline one again. Whereas if you live your life again as yourself with a part of you, your daemon, knowing the errors you made last time round, you have the opportunity for improvement and you can move on and you can evolve as part and parcel of the greater whole. You know, so we have this kind of logical synergy there whereby, you know, it makes, it makes logical sense and it makes moral sense for that kind of scenario. And we're all moving to what Tom calls love. You know, the idea that a, a system which has got low entropy is, is, I always get the entropy the wrong way around, so forgive me if I've done that, but the idea that everybody's working together, the system is working together and it's moving away from chaos towards order. And maybe that's what, you know, the universe started with a big bang. And since then, it's supposed to be moving downwards and cooling down. But the reality could be that there's this alternate channels that's running the other way, where life itself is running towards trying to get everything right and working in the correct way. Hmm. So I'm, I'm fascinated by this idea as well that you mentioned, Tom, that the system has, has kind of uh, decentralized, uh, again, for the lack of a better term, it itself. It's compartmentalized itself because it's a... Well, for one, it's a better way of doing things. It becomes less maybe vulnerable even, and it's a more more uh, coherent way. That it, it can do more things at the same time, si simultaneously in that sense, I guess. Uh, but yeah, it's, a, it's a parallel processing. Instead of having one, you know, one monolithic thing that can interact with itself, you know, you parallel process. Now you have, you know, lots and lots of things who all have uh, the ability to lower their entropy. That's a much better, uh, you know, to parallel process that that function uh, is a much a much better job. You know, what what kind of experience do you have, you know, with yourself? Well, you can think about things, but you're very limited. It's that interaction that challenges you. That's right. And uh, and the question as well on top of that is, if our consciousness drives reality, um, if that is more or or less powerful. I'm thinking, I guess, in one sense of the, of the collective consciousness here as well the mass consciousness because in one regard i can see that it is the whole that is that is creating uh, the world that we're living in and so forth as well or if there's is this overarching um consciousness of of, of the, the larger consciousness system that you mentioned uh, tom that actually is overseeing this this process because in one sense uh and we alluded to this last time we had you on as well that, that there is forces and people who have uh, you know, a stronger free will, for instance, than other people, individual stronger will that have kind of um, overrun other people's free will in that sense. And if something would influence the mass consciousness too much, do you think that is something, this larger consciousness system would kind of come back into the picture and knock it back into the right uh, direction again, so to speak? Or how do you view that, Tom? 
part of the problem comes as we view these these uh, various pieces. These these pieces are metaphors. When we talk about that larger consciousness system and kind of the overseer and that kind of stuff, suddenly in our mind, an overseer is a is a uh, individual different than us. It's something you know. In our reality, because of our rule set, we kind of make everything is different. It all exists in its own space, and it all is its, its unique individuality. We really are all one thing. So think of this as just a big data field, okay? And we're a part of that data field. And then we don't have um, so much of these groupings other than we need them as metaphors to help ourselves talk about them. So we have things like, um, what, higher selves. Uh, you know, this is like uh, Anthony's uh, Damon. You know, we have higher selves, uh, over souls. We have all these different metaphors that talk about uh, kind of the larger us of consciousness, and we're kind of the smaller us as consciousness. And, and all these things are, though, just metaphors. Right. Okay. So that's, they're ways of, for us to, to uh, dice things up, to make pigeonholes, to make categories and give them names so that we can talk about them. But don't get uh, carried away and think that because we broke it up into these pieces, that these pieces sit there and, you know, exist as as separate chunks that are kind of disconnected from us right we're all connected to this mm -hmm. we're all connected together it's all one information field now yes there is a thing called group consciousness and basically it's just the vector sum of all the individual pieces of that consciousness and yes they have a larger system that has this virtual reality of ours it's a it's a learning lab it's a it's a trainer like uh, flight trainers that uh, that the pilots train in. You know, this is a trainer and we're here to lower our entropy, to grow up, to become love, uh, spiritual growth, uh, however you want to call that. And because of that, the system doesn't just, um, you know, create the situation and then totally ignore it and let it go. The, the system doesn't interfere with it. We get to make good or bad choices and nothing changes that. But the system can, can, how do you say it? Uh, manipulates not the right word, but it can nudge us right. in various directions to make this virtual reality trainer a more effective trainer. But it has to do this within the rules, if you will. You know, it's not a. It can't be a heavy-handed sort of thing. It has to be an individual kind of thing. So it's not that this this um, um, administrator, if you will, sees, uh-oh, though, that's not good. Look at that. There's, there's about to be a, a war there. Uh, I guess I'll put an end to that, you know, right, and right. Suddenly, suddenly all the nukes go limp, you know, and they, all the triggering mechanisms don't work. It's not that sort of thing. Sure. We're not uh, being manipulated by a, a being who is watching us and, and turning the dials and pulling the strings. That's, it doesn't work that way. We just are as we are, and we do what we do, but individually... We can be nudged this way and that. We can have these uh, deja vu moments that show us something. We can have uh, dreams that uh, give us understanding. We can get this little voice in our head that uh, tells us you know, something. It's called intuition, right? Hmm. All of these ways are basically um, connections, ports, if you will, um, communication ports that we have with the larger system. So it's not that the larger system backs out and has no interaction, but it does let us do what we do, for better or for worse, because otherwise it can't work. You can't have consciousness without the free will. You know, then it just becomes uh, you know, a, a program play that everybody's going through the motions, and if you analyze that logically, it doesn't make any sense. There's no value in it. There's no point. That would not happen because it has no value. Things, things with, no, with no value and no ability to produce don't evolve. You know, randomness doesn't evolve. It's just it's randomness. Uh, Anthony, let's get your, your comment on that or if there's anything else you're thinking about and then we can uh, begin to round things up for the first hour. But go ahead, Anthony, if there's anything you want to add to that or, or have a different view on uh, maybe. Yeah, no, no. It's it's very much a model that is similar to my own. Again, we we have slight differences in in what what we define the levels of the um, the guidance in terms of, of of what is happening here. But I think I very much go with the holism idea. But I would suggest that within my model, within my big toe, within my Bohmian IMAX ground theory of everything, 
what I'm suggesting is that we are living in this this three-dimensional recreation of our lives, this drawing up information from the Akashic record or from wherever. Uh, but what is happening is that as we live this, our daemon, because it has lived the life before, is aware of the mistakes we, we made last time round, for want of a better term. And therefore, when we talk about intuition and we talk about guidance and we talk about precognitions and dream precognitions, I would argue that's because, and it's probably far more prosaic, I would argue that that's because there is a part of you that remembers the events that took place last time round and is subtly trying to move you to another route, another part of the computer game that you didn't take last time round because you made some traumatic mistake in one way or another. However, there is then the argument of the collective conscious, the collective unconscious that sits above that, uh, the uber daemon or what um, Tom would consider to be the, the, the absolute unbounded oneness, the whatever it is that's, that, that's experiencing through us, as it were. And I think that makes sense as well, you know, that, 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 that there is something behind it all as well. Um, and I, what I particularly like about Tom's model is one of the major problems I've had throughout my career of writing is when people ask me, well, what's it all for? You know, it's the, it's the teleological argument, you know, the, the idea of, well, it must, there must be a reason for everything. Tom's model very much gives the reason for everything because all we're doing is we're, we're trying to equalize the system. And, and that makes sense to me. So it, it gives it a reason without necessarily introducing the concept of an all-seeing, all-personal God figure right. that actually has a plan for everything. Mm. It's a far more um, beguiling and interesting concept and the idea that, yes, there, there is a plan, but it's no, more, no different to a plan to the way in which we have evolved throughout the centuries via DNA and via, via Darwin and some Darwinian selection or whatever particular ideas you believe. So that makes sense to me and it does make sense to me and it works very well as a model. Absolutely. Yeah, and I agree with, I agree with, uh, with Tony. Uh, we do accumulate this knowledge. You know, it's, in a digital information system, information is not lost. We do accumulate this knowledge. We do get otherwise, uh, you know, the starting over uh, wouldn't be uh, nearly so effective if you couldn't learn. You know, if it wasn't, uh, if you didn't get wiser as time went on, uh, it wouldn't be nearly as effective. So, of course, we do learn, and uh, we are uh, more than just this, the, this what we call, what I call little C consciousness, which is our awareness here. There is a larger component of us, and that component is well aware of why we're there and what we're supposed to be doing, and uh, you know, what we need to do next, and that's part of our connection back into this larger system. But again, all these things are, are metaphors. It's all part of a larger system in the process of evolving itself. And why does it evolve itself? Well, it's either evolve or die. You know, if you're a system, you either deteriorate or you grow. Hmm. And uh, you know, so it's just a natural thing for a self-modifying aware system to lower its entropy, to grow, to evolve. It changes. And uh, we're just a part of that, that process, and in that process, we continually uh, grow from life experience to life experience. It, uh, it's, it's cumulative. Otherwise, you, you would never get anywhere if it wasn't cumulative. You'd be kind of stuck. You'd, you'd uh, not be able to um, progress. You know, it's just like our evolution is cumulative. You know, we started with you know, one-celled things, many-celled things, and they differentiated, and then we got uh, things swimming in the sea, and then they walked out because there was more food outside than inside and so on. So it just it keeps going. Hmm. It adapts. It evolves just because it does, because it can around the word foot, leg or something. <laughs> yeah. Meta, my big metatarsal, you know, something like that. Uh, that's really good. And uh, uh, we, if we, you know, examine or a little bit of the work that uh, the both of you have been doing uh, individually, so to speak, in that sense, um, and we can get into, obviously, if there's, you know, if you, Anthony, feel that there's anything missing from the theory of everything that, uh, uh, that Tom uh, you know, lays forward in that sense. But... Uh, Tom, Tom, maybe you can just comment quickly a little bit on, on Anthony's work as well. How, how did you approach this? Do you, were you fascinated? Do you think, ah, there's a little bit, maybe something missing here and there? Or, or how did you approach uh, Anthony's work, Tom? Well, the, uh, both of us are heading in the same direction, obviously. Uh, both of us are uh, 
uh, on, you know, approach from different from different angles. But one of my favorite uh, things to tell people is that there is but one truth, but there are many, many, many valid ways of approaching that truth. And that's really a very good thing because some people will relate to this approach and some people will relate to a different approach. So the more approaches we have that uh, tend to converge, then actually uh, you know, the much better uh, we all are at trying to communicate what's going on. And people who read my book then will be able to appreciate Anthony's book more and will be drawn to that and vice versa. So hmm. I see it all as being very synergistic. We all are... But we were still coming to the same conclusions. And I like to use the analogy, it's rather similar to when David Bohm was doing his work on the holographic nature of reality and the holographic nature of the universe. And he was approached by, um, initially I think it was Carl Pribram's son. Uh, and Carl Pribram is a psychologist that was based, probably still is, at Georgetown University. And what Carl was doing is he was doing it from the brain side outwards. So effectively, you know, there was the cosmological quantum physics model that um, David Bohm was working on, and then it was Pribram coming up from a different direction. And by the meeting of the two of them, they actually realized that the, their overall hypothesis of theory had so much greater strength by taking it from the two angles. And I know from reading Tom's work that I very much have that feeling in terms of what Tom does. Now, the other strange irony of this is that... Um, we both use the concept of my big toe, my uh, big toe, as an acronym, um, hmm. and this this quite amazes me as to how we could have possibly come up with the two things. Because um, big toe for me is is what I call uh, my Bohmian IMAX grand theory of everything, which we might get the opportunity to talk about later. And of course, Tom's my big toe is my big grand theory of everything. So we both have toes, and Tom and I were, were talking on, um, on Skype about 20 minutes ago, and I was thinking we should be able to think of some kind of acronym. Around. It's created and so forth as well. Uh, I think when we both had you guys on individually, we talked quite a bit about the mes metaphysical aspect as well to all of this and some of the, the weirdness mm -hmm. that we see out there and to try to, to be able to explain some of those things from this per per perspective. But maybe we can begin with you, Anthony, and maybe you can just uh, give us a short little outline, if you will, of you what you think drives reality, how it is created, uh, what some of the rules maybe is in that sense, and then we can hear from Tom and we can we can compare a little bit or, or continue from that point. Uh, but Anthony, go ahead. Okay, okay. From my point of view initially, when I first started with my first book, Is There Life After Death? The Extraordinary Science of What Happens When We Die, I was coming from a very neurological point of view because I was, one, I was looking for an explanation for, for certain neurological phenomena such as uh, deja vu sensations, near-death experience, these type of things. And I was very much working on the idea that these in some way were, were, were neurologically based, which, which I still consider they are. And I think Tom and I would both agree that we're using the term neurologically based in a very, very loose way. If we consider the, uh, the brain or the, the, the physical, that the brain is some kind of a portal, as it were, um, between alternate realities or, or gives us an opportunity to understand the reality behind the reality. But my viewpoint was trying to, to come to a, a model of what might happen to human consciousness at the point of death. And what We're not competing for who's got the right answer. We're all sharing our own ways of approaching that answer. And by the sharing, I think it's, all, it, it's a much stronger story that we have to tell because of the multiple approaches. So when I looked at Anthony's, uh, the way we differ, you, you brought that up. Anthony has a little more of a physical uh, approach to to it, and uh, I have a less of one. I I'm in the virtual reality uh, uh, camp, and uh, Anthony's moving that way as well. But uh, he still has more of a of a, a physical basis to the things that he's doing, such as uh, you know brains and and pineal glands and things like that. Hmm. And though I realize the connection there, I don't put those at the at the center of the. I don't put that as the causal feature. In other words, the thing that's making it happen. I put that as a as a an artifact of what's happening, so that's a that's kind of a, a little difference, but that's almost a technical difference, um, hmm. which is which is good. We should have these differences. Absolutely, that uh, helps to refine the work and so forth. And obviously, if we have any new listeners with us uh, tuning in right now, we recommend you obviously to go into the archive and listen individually to the programs, both that we've done with Tom 
uh, and Anthony, uh, if you want to hear kind of a full, uh, more in-depth, uh, you know, uh, outlay or, or presentation of, of uh, their individual material and how they dovetail as well. Uh, very, very interesting. But I want to get into the topic a little bit of what drives reality, how real. Well, Tom, Tom's work was, um, was on various occasions it was mentioned to me over a period of, of around about five or six years. And various individuals that have been attracted to my work said, you really want to read into what Tom Campbell's writing about my big toe. Uh, but the person that really facilitated the link was uh, a young Slovak PhD student by the name of Martin Peniak. Um, who came along to one of my, he emailed me initially and then came along to one of my lectures that I did down in the south of England. And he approached me and he said, genuinely, you really need to speak to uh, Tom Campbell about his work. And there was an also uh, somebody else from my forum called Carl Lamarx. And Carl again had said that my big toe is really quite up your street. Uh, and then I think, Tom, I think we then, I think I might have then contacted you, I guess. And we, we swapped books, and yes. uh, it was, wasn't it? And mm -hmm. I then received the, the the trilogy of my big toe, and I think I sent you my two books. And, yes, you did. And I found my big toe to be one of these kind of books that you read, and as soon as you finish it, you want to reread it again because the depth in which Tom goes to and the, the power of his model is simply amazing. And I was going through it, making notes here, there, and everywhere because. All I could see was synergy everywhere. Now, Tom was coming at it from um, a slightly different angle to myself. 